Well, the crowd has settled down now. I have one announcement before I introduce today's wonderful speakers. Don't forget CBR Research Day, August 9th. Please register. Please register. Bring your families. Bring your families, Dr. Conway said. Okay, we'll do that. Um, I am thrilled to introduce two of my postdoctoral fellows. My laboratory works on the coagulation biochemistry. And these two postdoctoral fellows that I've recently recruited do not know coagulation biochemistry. So they're truly, truly brave people. But what they bring to my laboratory are some really vital talents uh, that they learned during their uh, graduate work. And they're going to tell you about their graduate work. I thought it would be a really good opportunity for you to see these skills see these skills that they bring to the Center for Blood Research. They both have very successful graduate um, programs. And we're going to be hearing from Mohammed Rashid and Li Hua Hao, who have both come to us from really far away. Um, at no expense to the Center for Blood Research, I might admit. Uh, first, so first, we're going to hear from Mohamed, who did a medical microbiology master's and undergrad at the University of Dhaka in Bangladesh. And then he came to Canada to do his PhD at the University of Manitoba with a, a famous guy, uh, Kevin Coombs. And he's shifted from master's to PhD from public health, well, really molecules in public health, to hardcore uh, molecular virology. So, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ed, for the introduction. So, uh, let's start, right? I was gonna get a sandwich, probably. <laughs> So everyone in this audience knows about the coronavirus and uh, it has killed about uh, 7 million people so far. And if I want to say that there is a culprit that can do greater devastation than coronavirus, that is influenza A virus. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the possibility of a development and antiviral drug uh, against influenza A virus targeting a host cellular protein called PSMA2. So what is influenza A virus? So influ influenza A virus belongs to the family. Orthomyxoviridae is a single standard RNA virus uh, which infects around a billion people worldwide every year and killing about half a million. And that is just from the seasonal flu. And uh, during the pandemic events, uh, it can kill millions. If I just give an example of the Spanish flu that happened in 1980s, uh, 18, that, that killed more than 50 million people. And a couple of more pandemic even happened in last century. And there, there is very likely that this virus uh, will strike us again in near future. The question here is that, are we prepared for the next pandemic? Uh, obviously, I have some good news that we have flu vaccine. We get flu shot every year. And the flu vaccine contains a, a couple of a mixture of uh, some influenza A and B virus, and the composition depends on a prediction that which virus is going to strike us in next season, and that prediction sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, and we have uh, uh, FDA approved uh, antiviral drugs. The problem here is that this influenza A virus has a wide host range, and uh, because of that, like we are in a very critical. Uh, position in the ecosystem where we get infected by animal virus very often. We get flu, like bird flu, swine flu. We often hear about that. And the problem because, becomes even worse uh, with the emergence of uh, new strains by genetic reassortments and recombination. So most often uh, the flu shot ends up with a very low effectiveness and virus becomes resistant. So what is the solution? So let's start with a basic virology. So as an intercellular uh, parasite, the viruses need the, the help of host cellular protein for its replication. We all know that. So 
uh, if we can find out a host protein that is critical for the replication of influenza virus, that opens up the possibility of development a broad spectrum antiviral, and that can solve this problem. So, uh, so far hundreds of protein has been found important for different stages of replication. As you can see in this, this figure, this is a replication cycle of influenza and many proteins that was found important for different stages of influenza virus replication. Unfortunately, we still don't have an antiviral drug targeting a host cellular protein. So the search is still going on. And in my PhD, I also did similar kind of thing. So what happened is that before I started my PhD, uh, another student, a former student called Phil Simon, who infected human lung epithelial cells with influenza virus. And he found uh, a list of protein those were significantly dysregulated, like upregulated or uh, downregulated in their expression after viral infection. And from them, many of them actually interact with the fibronectin. So I selected about 56 of this uh, fibronectin interacting protein and was trying to find out if that was important for the viral replication. So I did a quick siRNA screening uh, with a 96 well platform, uh, plate format and I found that knocking down of at least 10 of them significantly reduces the virus titer in the supernatant. So that impacts the virus replication. From there, I selected three of them for my thesis and I followed up for my PhD. But uh, because of uh, the shortage of time today, I will just talk about only one of them that is PSMA2. So proteasome uh, subunit alpha type two or PSMA2, what is it? So PSMA2 is a part of 20S proteasome uh, uh, in a broad sense that is a part of 26S proteasome as well. So 20S, in a 20S proteasome, it has alpha subunit and beta, uh, beta ring, and PSMA2 is a part of the alpha ring. And it is involved in uh, the degradation and recycling of def defective proteins in the cell and proteolytic modification of regulatory proteins as well as the functional activity of the PSMA2 was found activated in influenza A virus infected cells in previous experiments. And also it was found important for the replication of West Nile virus and HIV virus uh, in previous studies. So based on this uh, finding, I hypothesized that influenza A virus uses PSMA2 directly or indirectly through cellular signaling pathways to complete its replication cycle and with an aim to understand what is the impact of PSMA2 knockdown on viral influenza virus replication, and to understand what is the role of this PSMA2 in cellular signaling pathways that might be important for the, the, the influenza virus replication. For doing that, what I did is that I, I collected human lung epithelial cells. Uh, so as you know, for influenza, their primary target is the lung. So I collected lung epithelial cells uh, that is called A549, infected and transfected with uh, PSMA2 siRNA to knock down the expression of PSMA2 and infected them with influenza A virus uh, laboratory strain called PR8. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to understand what was the impact of this knockdown on progeny virus yield by plaque assay, viral protein translation by Western blot, and viral genome replication by QRT PCR. Uh, intracellular localization of the viral protein by immunofluorescent microscopy and the impact on cellular signaling pathways by uh, a proteomic technique called SOMA scan. So the first question that I asked is that what is the impact of the PSMA2 knockdown on progeny virus here? For doing that, what I did is that I infected wild type cells. Here it is denoted by NSC or non-silencing control because I used a scrambled siRNA on that and also PSMA2 knockdown cells, infected them with lab adapted PR8 strain and quantified the virus in the supernatant at different time points up to 45 hours. And I uh, checked the amount of virus reduction by percentage. There was about 97, 90, uh, more, more than 90% reduction of the virus titer in PSMA2 knockdown cell supernatant. And that wasn't only true for this laboratory PR8 strain, but also the pandemic nine is a pandemic strain and also a, uh, uh, a seasonal strain called WSN was also inhibited by the PSMA2 knockdown. 
So the PSM to knockdown inhibits the replication of progeny influenza virus YL. So the next question I asked is that what is the impact of the PSM to knockdown on viral protein synthesis? So I selected two of these uh, uh, host protein. I did similar kind of experiment, but this time I checked the viral protein inside the cell in cell lysates. I selected two protein. That is one is NP is a structural protein. Another one is NS1 is a non-structural protein and check their expression by Western blood at different time points in the uh, wild type cells and PSM2 knockdown cells. <coughs> and I check the uh, knockdown, uh, the expression of PSM2. As you can see, there was a significant knockdown of PSM2. Unfortunately, I like surprisingly actually, I, I didn't see any impact on the viral proteins expression, uh, uh, like the impact of the PSM2 knockdown on viral protein expression. And that was also true for this pandemic nine and WSN strains as well. So the PSM2 knockdown does not affect the viral protein synthesis in influenza virus infected cells. So next I asked the, uh, I, I was trying to understand the impact of PSM2 knockdown on viral RNA replication that is by QRT-PCR. So I, I collected the RNA uh, from the infected uh, in, in the from the wild type cell and PSM2 knockdown cells and targeted three of the host genome that is NS1, NP, and ACA. And again, to my surprise, that was not impacted by PSM2 knockdown. Then I checked the localization of the viral protein. I targeted NP, the structural protein. And as you can see, the red indicates the uh, viral protein and which was glowing more in the PSM2 knockdown cells, which indicates that uh, the viral protein might be accumulating inside the cells. So what I said, like PSM2 knockdown does not affect the viral RNA replication, but causes localized accumulation of the viral protein. So this is a replication cycle of influenza virus. So where the influenza virus binds with uh, the cell membrane, uh, and after the attachment, it, uh, it, uh, through endocytosis, it goes inside the cells. It leaves its, uh, uh, its, its genetic material which travels inside the nucleus, how it replicates and then assembles and then makes the protein by translation. And then finally it assembles on the membrane. So with our experiments, what we saw like the viral translation wasn't affected as well as the viral RNA replication was not affected as well, which indicates that anything happening in the RP stream of the replication was not affected either. So there are less virus outside indicating that something is happening here on the viral assembly or the later stage of the replication. So PSM2 may play a role in the assembly or release of the influenza virus replication. So after that, uh, to my next aim, I wanted to know what was the impact of the PSM2 knockdown on the cellular signaling pathways that is might be important for the influenza virus. For doing that, I did a proteomic study uh, and that is called SOMI scan. That is a high throughput uh, 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 a proteomic technique that can detect more than 1300 protein from a cell. And that is done in a 96 well plate format. And each of the well is coated with uh, somomers, like 1300 somomers that can specifically bind with a specific protein, which uh, uh, is bound with the biotin and uh, fluorescent tag. And this was uh, this when the protein binds with the somomer that was uh, photolytically cleaved and detected by a microarray kind of technique. And that eventually gives you a proteomic, quant quantified proteomic data of 1300 proteins from each sample. So for understanding the impact on the cellular proteome, I need to, need to know like the protein that was dysregulated and do a bioinformatic analysis. So I did that with uh, the SOMI scan. I was trying to understand how does the impact of the PSM2 knockdown itself on the cellular proteome, also the impact of the the viral infection in, in wild type cells, uh, and also the infection of influenza virus in PSM2 knockdown cells. So I will use this abbreviation in later uh, slides, you might see them. So I had those proteomic data and I did uh, bioinformatic analysis to understand how is the impact on cellular signaling pathways. So I found that there are 43 signaling pathways, those are significantly inhibited in the wild type cells after influenza virus infection, 
which was not even significantly impacted in the PSMA to knockdown cells. Here you can see this uh, uh, blue means inhibited, red means activated signaling pathways, and gray means that was not affected. So among them, I found this uh, from this 43, 10 of the signaling pathways, those are significantly activated by PSMA2 knockdown, indicating that those might be a potential target to follow up. And I looked into the number of proteins that are significantly affected on the signaling pathways and found this one was the most promising, it's called NRF2 mediated oxidative response pathway based on the number of protein that was affected in that signaling pathway. So I did follow up that pathway. So what is NRF2 mediated oxidative response pathway and what happens during the viral infection? In regular condition, this NRF2 is bound with uh, uh, creep one and KLU complex. And then it becomes evigoinited uh, frequently and degraded by proteasome. And during a viral infection that generates ROS and this uh, like reactive oxygen species, which acts on this complex and NRF2 becomes deassociated from the complex, becomes phosphorylated, which translocates inside the nucleus, binds with this ARE complex and activates the anti-oxidative uh, response pathway and prepares some antioxidative mo molecules that reduces the ROS level in the cell because the ROS is also uh, toxic for the cells as well. So the cell doesn't want to get more, more, more ROS in the cell. So I wanted to follow up with this pathway and wanted to see like what is happening with this ROS level and what is happening with the translocation of the NRF2. So the first I wa was wondering what is the impact of the PSMA to knock down on cellular ROS level. So I checked the ROS level in the wild type cells in NSC, you can see, uh, and in the, in the wild type cells infected with the, uh, with the virus, influenza virus, in PSMO2 knockdown cells itself, and also the PSMO2 knockdown cells after infection as uh, detecting the ROS level in the cell. And as you can see, uh, uh, I uh, did some statistics, so the, the viral infection significantly reduced the ROS level in the cell, while the PSMA2 knockdown caused a significant increase of the ROS level in the cell, and the ROS level goes even higher uh, in the PSMA2 knockdown cells after viral infection. So I was wondering if this ROS is killing my cell, and if that is true, if I use a ROS scavenger, that should increase the virus number or restore the number of the virus. So I use a ROS scavenger called NAC, and which showed a significant enhancement of the virus uh, in the cell. And also even in the PSMA2 knockdown cells, the virus, uh, uh, the, the number that was reduced, that was restored again. So the answer is yes. And I also used another uh, molecule called MG132, which is a proteasome inhibitor to see uh, if that is inhibiting the, uh, the that knockdown is inhibit that, that, that Proteasome you know, inhibitor can also reduce the virus. Uh, so, as you wondering, what is the translocation uh, impact on the translocation of the NRF2 to, to the nucleus? So, I did an IF, and you can see the green means uh, uh, green uh, stain for the NRF2. So, as you can see in the normal viral infection in the wild type cells, there was a enhancement of of the intensity of the NRF2 in the nucleus, which didn't happen in the PSMA2 knockdown cells. So the NRF uh, influenza FRS infection enhances the translocation of NRF2 to the nucleus, but PSMA2 knockdown inhibits it. So what is happening uh, as a whole in summary? So we know in normal condition, uh, this uh, NRF2 complex is degraded by the proteasome, but using a SRNA, PSM2 SRNA that is inhibiting the proteasome and which is causing accumulation of the NRF2 in the cytoplasm. During the viral infection, it is making the ROS and the NRF2 got deassociated, but its translocation to the nucleus was inhibited. So, which uh, inhibits the transcriptional activation of antioxidative response. As a result, the cellular ROS level is going up, which in turn is inhibiting the virus. So if we go back to our previous model where we showed like what is happening with the PSMA2, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that that oxidative response is inhibiting the assembly of the virus. So with this, I 
I'd like to thank my previous supervisor, Dr. Kevin Coombs, and my previous lab members. Also, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ed Prisdal for giving me the opportunity here and the lab members for their, uh, for their help and feedback. And my uh, um, funding organizations, as well as to CVR for giving me the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Well, I think the obvious question that everybody's dying to ask you, maybe I should turn the microphone on so everybody can hear my obvious question. Something that we've talked about already, and that is that the idea here would be to target probably localized enhancement of ROS. You're suggesting that ROS is an antiviral part of the immune system. But we already know that ROS triggers all kinds of vascular disease and all kinds of other pro-inflammatory responses. So this is counterintuitive. While increasing ROS, you're also inducing other types of disease. So as an antiviral target, this may not be to our advantage. So how, how, can, we, how can we work this into a pathway as a medicine? Have you given this some thought with Kevin? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, not only uh, the ROS, but if uh, if I just think of the targeting PSMA2 as a uh, as a host protein for antiviral uh, uh, drug uh, like development, that is not even a good idea because PSMA2 is really a, a, a one of the the key protein in the cell. It has a lot of uh, function in the cell. So we, we need further experiment to understand this mechanism and see like more of like where we can target. So it is like just a beginning of the experiment. Like we need to know the function more uh, like carefully to develop that. So again, like for the ROS, ROS is a, it has like both function. Like it's like two way sort. It can kill the cell virus. At the same time, it is toxic to the cell as well. So we need to find out like what is the level and how it is working? So at this point, we cannot say like we can do that. Like directly, we can just give and put use of inhibitor and do that. But uh, uh, we need to understand the mechanism more clearly to do that. Anything like that. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our next speaker if there's one more question. That's you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our second speaker of the day, Li Hua Hao, is an MD-PhD. She did her medical degree at Shandong First Medical University in Tai'an, in China. She then went on to do a PhD in Junbok National University in South Korea with a very famous scientist, Byung Hyun Park. Uh, and, and then she went and did her medical residency in Wuhan, China. Uh, she then came over to join our laboratory. Um, like Muhammad, she has received numerous awards, in, uh, including a Young Scientist Award. And she also was a PI on a uh, competitive grant uh, before joining us. Um, so please. So hi everybody, thanks Ed for introducing me. And today my topic is the therapeutic strategy for psoriasis of stage three centric wheel. My PhD supervisor is Dr. Pyongyang Park from Jombu National University, South Korea. First, I, I will give some background information about the psoriasis. So psoriasis is a uh, immune-mediated uh, chronic inflammatory skin disorder. 
it's a chronic disease with no cure. So many people think the psoriasis is just a rush with the itchy, but actually it's not. Some psoriasis patients can develop the psoriasis arthritis. You can barely move your hand at the end. And another bad news is everyone takes the risk to get the psoriasis. In the risk including the alcohol, the stress, the smoking, or some medication, and also genetic issue contributes to the psoriasis development. So in order, in order to know about know more about the psoriasis development, so I put another picture in here. So you can find there are some triggers. There are some triggers for the psoriasis development. The infection or the injury or the medication can stimulate the keratinocyte. And the stressed keratinocyte can secrete the cytokine and activate the dendritic cell in the dermal. So the dendritic cell are gonna produce more cytokine and activate the T cell. And the T cell can differentiate it to T helper cell. And this immune cell are gonna secrete more cytokine and go back to the keratinocyte. So cause the abnormal proliferation of the keratinocyte. So this is a whole process of the psoriasis. We can know that both the immune cell, especially the Th17 cell, and also keratinocyte contributes to psoriasis development. And there is one key reg regulator for both keratinocyte and Th17 cell. It's a state three. So I'm gonna introduce the state three in the next two slides. So first, state three in the Th17 cell differentiation. So state three, the name is signal transducer and activator of transcription three. It has recently emerged as a key player in the Th17 cell differentiation. So here is a Th17 cell. When the cytokine binds to the receptor, it can it's gonna activate the downstream signaling. So the phosphorus state three is gonna go to the nuclear and activate the ARA gamma T. The ARA gamma T is a key transcriptional factor for Th17 cell differentiation, and it can uh, induce a downstream genes expression and cytokines production. And this way also very important for the keratinocyte proliferation. And it's, the study already shows that this way is highly expressed in the human thoracic lesions. And in the keratinocyte, when cytokine binds to the receptor and the state three be phosphorylated, go to the nuclear, and it can cause the proliferation marker expression. So from these two slides, we can know that state three is pretty important in both Th17 cell and keratinocyte, but it must be phosphorylated. So there must be some other upstream enzyme phosphorylate state three. So next I will introduce one of the important upstream enzyme, the PKM2. The PKM, the PK means the pyruvate kinase. It's a K glucose metabolic enzyme, and it can help to pro produce the ATP and supply the energy. And the PKM2 belongs to the PK. So usually many other articles focus on the effects of PKM2 on cancer model it shows it plays a crucial role. So it's not only because the PKM2 can modulate the state three and the PKM2 itself also can induce a proliferation marker expression in the cancer cell. So there's one thing in common about the cancer and the psoriasis is both of them has a proliferation. This proliferation is abnormal. So as we know, PKM2 state three plays important role in the cancer. So it's supposed to have some effect in the psoriasis. So in this project, we're gonna target the PKM2 state three signaling in psoriasis model. So next I'm gonna introduce a star of this project. It's the AZA. The whole name is 2-hydroxycinnamon dehyde. It's isolated from the cinnamon. And some other study shows the HCA has anti-tumor effect by downregulating the phosphor PKM2 in cancer model. 
but nobody knows whether the HCA has uh, some positive effect on the psoriasis. So we're gonna do this research. So I will give some information about the psoriasis mice model. A common mouse model is induced by the 5% emic mode cream application. So usually on day zero or day minus one, we shave the mice. It means we remove all the fur from the back. And from day one to day six, we apply the emic mode cream on the back. And day seven, sacrifice the mice. For the mechanism is emic mode can bind with the total receptor seven and activate the downstream genes and induce the inflammatory cytokine production and finally cause the psoriasis like dermatitis. So we got the first question. Can the HCA attenuate psoriasis in the mice? The answer is yes. So I'm gonna introduce the whole result one by one. So in the panel A shows the whole protocol for my experiment. On day minus one, I shave the mice. After two days from day one to day six, apply the emic mode cream every day. And during this time, I also do the oral garbage for the HCA and MTX. For the HCA, we use two different concentration. One is 10 milligram per kilogram, another is 30 milligram per kilogram. And the MTX, the name is methotrexate. This is a medication already used for the psoriasis patient in the clinic. But the side effect of the MTX is it can cause the damage in the lung and liver. The long-term use of the methotrexate gonna cause the liver fibrosis. That's why we need a better candidate for the psoriasis treatment. So in panel B, we also check the body weight because the body weight sometimes can reflect the mice condition. We found the imic mode itself can decrease the body weight a little bit, but there is no significant difference between these four groups. In panel C, we checked the AST and ART level. These two are indicator for the liver function. We didn't find any difference, and which, which is good because it means HCA is not, not toxic for the liver. And in panel D, we, it shows the phenotype of the back skin. So this control shows the normal back skin of the mice. And vehicle emic mode group shows the psoriasis like dermatitis, including the red skin and also the white scale. And the, both the MTX and HCA group shows better phenotype compared with the vehicle group. And in panel E, we did the passive score analysis. The passive score means the psoriasis, uh, uh, psoriasis area severity index. It indicates the severity of the psoriasis in the mice. It includes the scaling, the asthma, the sickness, and the total score. This data shows that HCA treatment can suppress the passive score in mice. In panel F, we did the HE staining and IHC staining. The HE staining shows the epidemic sickness decreased by the HCA treatment. And the KS67 is a marker for the proliferation. It also shows suppressed by the HCA treatment. And next figure, we check the spleen size because spleen size also can reflect the immune system response in mice. We found the spleen size is quite big in the vehicle emic mode group, but smaller in the HCA treatment group. And we also do the spleen index. It means the spleen weight per body weight because the body weight of the mice is different. Sometimes if, the, if this mice is bigger than others, the spleen size is also bigger. So we do the spleen index. We found it's also suppressed by the HCA treatment. And in panda B and in panda C, we check cytokines expression in the serum and the genes expression in the skin, we found nearly all the cytokines suppressed by the HCA treatment. And in panel D, we checked the PKM2 state 3 signaling. We found HCA treatment can suppress phosphorus PKM2 and the phosphorus state 3.
So all this data shows that HC can attenuate the psoriasis phenotype in the mice. So we got the question two, what's the mechanism? So based on the introduction, we know that the immune cell, especially the TH17 cell, and also the current site contributes to the psoriasis. So does HC have the effect on the T cell activation or TH17 cell differentiation, or it has some effect on the current site proliferation? So in the next research, we're gonna focus on these two parts. So question three is, can HC suppress CT4 positive T cell activation and TH17 cell differentiation? So we first do the T cell activation. We isolate the primary naive CD4 positive T cell from mouse spleen, and we use anti CD3 and anti CD28 to stimulate the T cell. And on day three, we checked the surface marker and intracellular marker, this marker or T cell activation marker. We found HC treatment can suppress uh, T cell activation. And in panel B, we do the time course experiment. We check different days. We found on day three, this phosphor PKM2 and the phosphor day three shows pretty high expression. So in panel C, we, we choose the day three, we pre-treat with HCA, and on day three, we checked this PKM2 day three signaling. We found HCA treatment can block this signaling. So for TH17 cell differentiation, we also isolate the primary naive CD4 positive T cell. We first do the, C the T cell activation. And then for the TH17 cell differentiation, we add the differentiation media. And, and on day five, we check the, we do the flow analysis and check the percentage of TH17 cell. We found HCA treatment can suppress the TH17 cell percentage. And panel B, we checked the TH17 cell cytokine production in the condition media. We found it's also decreased. In panel C, we checked the uh, transcription factor for the TH17 cell differentiation. We found only the RR gamma tissue suppressed, but not other transcription factors, which is meaningful because the RR gamma T is a downstream genes for the state three. So in panel D, we checked the PKM2 state three and our T signaling, we found HCA treatment can block this signaling in TH17 cell. Because if the PKM2, phosphor PKM2 and phosphor state three want to show some effect, it must translocate from the cytoplasmic to the nuclear. So in panel E, we separate the protein to cytoplasmic and the nuclear we check the phosphor C3 and the phosphor PKM2. We found the HCA can also block the nuclear translocation. And because the PKM2 has different form, it has a monomer, it, falls, it has dimer and also the tetramer. So in panel F, we did cross-link assay to check different form of PKM2. We found there's no big difference of the monomer and HC treatment can increase the tetramol while suppress the dimer because the phosphor, state, the phosphor PKM2 is a dimer. So all these two slides shows that HCA can inhibit CD4 positive T cell activation and the TH17 cell differentiation. So what about another part for the carotenoid proliferation? So the question four is, can HCA inhibit the proliferation of carotenocyte? So we do the cell proliferation assay, we do the BRDO assay to check the cell proliferation. In panel A, we use condition media to treat the HACA T cell. HACA T cell is a carotenocyte cell line. We found the condition media from TH17 cell can, in, can induce the cell proliferation while HCA can suppress it. And panel B, we changed to another method. We directly use the cytokine, the interleukin-22. This cytokine can stimulate the carotenoid site and cause the proliferation. We got the similar pattern. In panel C, we checked the state three, PKM2 state three signaling. We found it shows similar pattern. The HCA can block this pathway in carotenoid site. And the panel D, we checked the Marker for the cell proliferation, it also shows 
suppressed by the HCA treatment. So this data shows that HCA can suppress the counteracite proliferation. So here is a whole summary of this project. Both the TH17 cell and the keratinocyte contribute to the psoriasis. The HCA in the TH17 cell can block this PKM2 state 3 signaling, so suppress the RR gamma T expression, those, then the cytokine production gonna decrease. So in the keratinocyte, HCA also blocked this signaling, so the proliferation marker suppressed. So that explains the HCA can be another drug candidate for the psoriasis, not only for the cancer, but maybe also for the psoriasis treatment. And here is an acknowledgement. Uh, thanks my PhD supervisor, Dr. Pyongyang Park and all the lab members in my previous lab. And the most important thing is I wanted to thank Dr. Ed Prestel to give me this chance to join our new lab. Everybody in the new lab is pretty nice, and I really enjoy. <laughs> I really enjoy the life in here. Thank you, and happy to answer any question. That was so interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I always, I'm always curious, why does psoriasis, maybe this is a little outside of your, your area, but why does it localize in certain areas? I mean, usually the elbows, the knees. Why? What's in the skin that causes it to localize there? Oh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, but for your question, my answer is actually, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's different types of the different types of the psoriasis. And actually the imikimote induced the psoriasis quite similar to the plague psoriasis. So uh, I'm not quite sure why some patients just show the lesions in specific area. But um, I think I gonna search and study. <laughs> yeah, thank you. In in this idea that there is different types of psoriasis, yeah. your experimental model mm -hmm. uh, testing HCA, yeah. do you think that this is going to be stratified to this various these various types of psoriasis? For instance, some people will get quite mm -hmm. serious patchy psoriasis mm -hmm. consistent with hair loss. Yeah. Granzyme B has been suggested mm -hmm. to be implicated in that yeah. locale. Yeah. As you and I have discussed yeah. previously. Do you think that's a very specific mm -hmm. mechanism and may involve some sort of different biochemistry? Or do mm -hmm. we have zero clue so far? Mm, I think the HCA is quite different with, uh, like you said, the granzyme B, because as I know, the granzyme B is produced by the natural natural killer cell or CD8 positive T cell. And it's also related to the apoptosis pathway, but the HCA usually have the, um, it can block the state three, but state three plays important role in different cell type. So I don't think the HCA can just have the effect on specific type, as long as state three plays the key role in that disease it's supposed to have some effect. Thank you. Thank you. And any other questions? And with that, I'd like to thank our two wonderful speakers. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.